Well, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to join you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, at Plymouth. Um, there's a nice relationship between Eden and the University of Plymouth. We just opened last month our Invisible Worlds exhibit, and that really benefited hugely from the, uh, the intellectual capital that Plymouth brought to the exhibit, and just the, the willingness of the teams here to indulge in cross-disciplinary discussions and crazy discussions about the invisible things that are too small, to, that we can't see that drive our lives, and the things that are too big that drive our lives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about extinction, biodiversity, and reasons to be cheerful, and try and give some impression of how where we're thinking Eden about what we do now that we are officially in the Anthropocene. Well, I say officially, it's not just happened. And I just want to also start by saying that title is completely wrong. Um, it's not conservation opportunities, it's things we really damn well need to do. So it's not something we might like to do, it's something we really have to do. And it's not about conservation. All of us in the conservation business are, are going through this extraordinary transition where we were trained in terms of a retrospective historical view of the planet as where we wanted to go. And over the last 20 years, that's been turned on its head. And we're now looking at, well, what do we want these habitats, these populations, these ecosystems to look like? How do we want them to interact? How do we want them to behave? Do we manage this transition to a much more chaotic future? Or do we just let it rip and see what happens? And I remember being trained as a student um, about how reintroductions in the UK should be guided by the Brit Botanical Society of the British Isles. It basically meant you had to prove that plant had been within a five square mile of the point of where you wanted to do the reintroduction. Now we're looking at an assisted migration and moving species in anticipation of climate change. Everything's been turned on its head. So I represent an institution that displays biodiversity, interprets biodiversity, and tells stories about the future. Our job at Eden is to bring people together bring them in together in the context of looking at the future and bring them in the context of the natural world and how we're going to live with it. And I always feel with institutions like ours at Eden that we present this lovely, glossy face. It is the happy future. It is the happy Anthropocene. But behind us, you can smell the wood smoke, you can, smell the, uh, you can hear the chainsaws, and you can hear the glug of silt running down East African streams. And we, we present this sort of to our guests, we, our great fear is that we offer two hours of salvation at the cost of a ticket. And you come into Eden and you leave and you've paid your fee and you are now absolved of responsibility for the future. And that's what terrifies us. We don't want to be that. But there's always that danger in places like museums, zoos, botanic gardens, where we offer absolution for the price of, an, of a ticket and a coffee, and if you're really feeling flush, a, ba a baobab smoothie. So, or do we want an Anthropocene of lament? And there's been a couple of projects over the last two years that have, that have really started thinking, me thinking about what we want the Anthropocene to look like. And I'll say we, because we shouldn't allow other people necessarily to define in total what the Anthropocene will do. As biologists, as conservationists, as people with an eye on the, the needs of, of our communities, we need to actually think about what we want those landscapes to look like. And we need to have the conversations with all our stakeholders to work out what those landscapes will look like. Otherwise, someone else will tell us. And well, I think we're remarkably nervous about stating our ambitions for some of these big topics. And I'd really encourage everyone to be a little bit more vocal in thinking about the next 100, 200 years and what we're going to leave the next few generations. This is the Lodge Mosaic. And at Florida International University, about five years ago, we, we pulled together an exhibit. This is a 2,000-year-old mosaic discovered in Israel. And it's a 2,000-year-old benchmark for Mediterranean biodiversity. And it got us all thinking, wow, things have changed. Things have really changed. So let's just introduce you to some of the actors of the, the Lodge Mosaic. And we're going to meet them at several points during the next talk. talk. So it's, it was a very fine mosaic for a very rich merchant in Lod. 
and we suspect it might have been someone involved with the wild animal trade. And you've got African elephant, probably shipped up through the Red Sea from the elephant trading port of Miro for the amphitheater games. You've got tigers, which would then have been found in what is now Iran and Turkey. You've got lions, which would have been all the way through the Middle East. You've got Simmeter horned oryx, extinct in the wild. Uh, you've got uh, Syrian wild ass being attacked by the Caspian tiger. And you've got lion pulling down the boobal, the extinct heart of beast from the north coast of Africa. And you've got monstrous sea fish. And so this is your baseline, shif shifting baseline index for a lot of biodiversity in the Mediterranean. And I wonder whether someone looking at a, an illustration of what we have now in 200 years or 100 times will say, oh, silly buggers. Let, look what they let slip through their hands. Look at the diversity and the richness and the extraordinary vitality of the world, and you've fouled it up. So we as a species um, have a somewhat ambivalent relationship to biodiversity. We love it, we catalogue it, we collect it, we define it. We eat it, we cultivate it. This is the world's first plant collecting expedition from the uh, pharaoh Hatshepsut, who sent boats down to what is probably Somalia, the land of Punt, to collect myrrh trees to be brought back to Egypt. And we take a delight in abundance. This whole E.O. Wilson's idea about biophilia is absolutely right. People love abundance. And at Eden, we exhibit abundance. And you go there... And this summer, there'll be 25 different varieties of tomato on exhibit in the Mediterranean biome. This, this is exhibits that we did in Miami with 200 varieties of mango. If you want to tell the history of the world, you can do that in 200 varieties of mango. But, as Will quite rightly pointed out in the previous presentation, for most of the population, there's a little bit of delight, but it's mostly necessity. And... I had the privilege of working for three years as part of a USAID program in the Sahel, looking at water and landscape, and you suddenly realize that, yes, trees are appreciated, but part of an agroforestry landscape. You've got your millets, you've got your timber and your, your charcoal, you've got your grass, one of the most fundamental resources for any African community, and you've got your water, which is both your drinking water, your washing water, and your fishing water. And then, within it, you may or may not have some wildlife. This is the, the Dama gazelle, which is down to about 150, 200 in the wild. And we forget about the extraordinary stories behind these natural resources that no one really talks about. This is, um, this is a charcoal warehouse in South Somalia, um, near a place I worked in in the 80s. And all that charcoal has been collected from Somalia, northern Kenya, and is about to be shipped off to the Middle East, to Dubai, and Abu Dhabi, and Riyadh, for the barbecues in the Middle East. That's thousands of acres of Acacia tortillas compressed into bags. This is the world's largest livestock migration from Somaliland up to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. These are live goats. And uh, we knew when these animals had arrived in the market in Dubai and Abu Dhabi by the sudden outbreak of diseases in the local gazelle population. It was within a week of the goats arriving from Somaliland, we'd find dead gazelles with various diseases. And so, for our future, when we're looking at biodiversity, it's not just the rare orchids, it's not just the strange, giant, stinking arums, it's actually working out the landscapes to, to deal with these challenges. So we've seen this before, and I'm going to, we're working on a museum at the moment, the mu uh, and it's all about extinction, and it promises to be the world's most dismal and depressing museum. It's the sort of museum where you'd, be, you'd get tickets to go and visit a French sanatorium afterwards, a one-way ticket. Um, and we've been looking at extinctions, and we've been, we're trying to work out so you don't feel like joining Exit after the exhibit, that you actually want to do something about it. And we're looking at this idea that basically we're going through this pattern of extinction, we're going through this pattern of landscape ex exploitation, and we've now got to rapidly transition as a community into a regenerative future, where we're, we're not just tolerant of ongoing damage, but we shift back to regenerating resources. Will's work in East Africa is very much about that. 
And we've been talking about when the Anthropocene started. You know, was it 1492? Was it the 50s atomic explosions and testings? We're going to push it all the way back to the Pleistocene overkills when those landscape changes really did ramify through the world as a result of the extinctions of the big mammals that we caused as a species. And as a species, we're really good at extinctions. And we don't lament extinctions. We've become rather immune to extinctions. And these are all 20th century extinctions from our backyard, North Africa and the Middle East, not that far away, not from some remote island where you'd expect a cascade of extinctions. These are all species that disappeared. This is the, the um, Syrian wild ass, when it disappeared in the 20s. The uh, Atlas lion may have held on till the 50s in Morocco. The uh, Bubal hartebeest, uh, again the 1920s. The last North African ostriches from the 60s in the Spanish Sahara. Uh, the last Arabian cheetahs that went in the 60s. And the Caspian tiger. The last one of those may have been seen on the edge of Afghanistan as late as, late as the 1990s. So a lot of these species went within a whisper of a, of a generation. There may be people alive who have seen Caspian lions, uh, Caspian tigers. And for many of us, extinction has a, a personal cost. The great Aldo Leopold said, to have an, an environmental or ecological education is to live in a world of wounds. You basically know what's going on if you've got an ecological education and you read the landscape. You, can, you know what's happening. And this is a species I spent two and a half years working on. This is Hibiscadelphus woodii from Kauai, in the Hawaiian Islands. It's part of that extinction apocalypse that's happening in the Hawaii. It's the World Center for Plant Extinctions. This was only discovered in the late 90s. There were four trees. By the time I got there, I was working at the National Tropical Botanic Gardens in Hawaii. There were two. And over two years, we did everything from grafting, from microprop to cross-pollination, to root cuttings, to air layering. And the fate of this species depended on good horticulture. And we couldn't track it. And the last tree died six years ago. So that's a species. And everyone in the species conservation game has a species or a population or a habitat that fell through their fingers. And there's a lot of literature now on the impact of conservation biodiversity loss. And you can, you can meet people in the business who are just burnt out because of the rate of loss and the species that they've seen go. So we've really got to get beyond this. So our first challenge for the Anthropocene is we've got to define our influence on it and what we want to contribute to the forging of what the Anthropocene will look like. Otherwise, others will. Um, we don't want it decided at Davos. We want it decided by a whole multitude of people of which we play a significant part because we understand the environment, we understand biodiversity. We've got the challenge of continued and unpredictable and now massive habitat loss, catastrophic species declines, pathogens and pests, and these mass uh, sort of mass die-offs that we're now seeing, like the die-off of saiga antelope earlier this year, are going to become more and more frequent and the disruptions in ecosystem services, soil, water, grass, stuff we depend on. And we're going to be increasingly working with the last chance refugee species. So um, this is the Northern Rangelands Trust species. So this is the Harola, 200 animals left, most of them in semi-managed conditions. The last Saharan cypress trees, about 40 in the wild. They haven't set seed for about 200 years, not regenerated for about 200 years. This is picking up. This is recovering. Every clone has now been propagated and is now held in a nursery in Algeria. And the Californian condor is an example of last-minute rescue that has succeeded. So you'll hear people say conservation isn't working. It is working. There are many case studies where species have been grabbed from the edge of extinction and moved back to a more viable state. It's just like everything we try and do, there aren't enough resources. The science and the practical application of conservation biology, species recovery, works. We've got to constantly hone it, we've got to constantly test it, but it's all about more resources and getting more people into the game. And that's good news. And so this is a case study of, we're, we're going to make a case study of this in the museum at MEMO. 
of a species that to us symbolizes where we stand in the Anthropocene on what to do with a threatened species. This is the northern white rhino, Ceratotherium simum cottoni. This is Sudan, about three weeks before he died, the last male of his type. And now there's only two females of the northern white rhino surviving, both in Old Pejita Ranch in Kenya. This is a 5,000-year-old rock painting from Morocco of, no of a northern white rhino. And by the time the northern white rhino was described in the early 1900s, it was Uganda, South Sudan, Congo, and Chad. Now it's down to two animals in a pen in Kenya. But what's interesting, I think about 12 individuals, skin, semen, over, are held in the frozen zoo at San Diego Zoo. So we've got a critically endangered species where the population on liquid nitrogen exceeds the metabolizing population. And we're going to see more and more of that. But we know what to do with white rhinos. This is the southern white rhino. 20 animals in 1895, now over 20,000. It can be done. And we're going to be doing lots more of that. And going back to Lod. So here's the... Um, Caspian tiger, or the Hersanian tiger, as Shakespeare referred to it. If you'd looked at your textbooks five years ago, that was a subspecies found here, all the way up into Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and across to Turkey. And then you had the Siberian tiger here. Well, the latest molecular evidence is they are the same beast. So now there's active discussions going on in Central Asia about reintroducing tigers to Central Asia, and large reserves being established that can now support not only the, the tigers, but the prey base. So a combination of a little bit of neat molecular genetics to prove that those two varieties are the same, some enlightened conservationists in Central Asia, and it's interesting, the government of Korea, is, South Korea, is playing a really facilitating role in putting a lot of these plans together. So there was a workshop in South Korea two years ago looking at a whole restoration ecology arc running from South Korea through the stands and Russia and all the way through. And this is, the, um, this is linked to the Bond Challenge, uh, 2018, with an ambition to restore 150 million hectares of deforested and degraded land by 2020. Let's applaud the ambition and perhaps ignore the deadline. Um, but some really ambitious national agendas linked to this with Brazil, um, really now making a pledge to, to restore 15 million hectares of Atlantic forest. And do you know what drove that? the taps running dry in Sao Paulo. It wasn't necessarily a deep desire about the endemic bromeliads and the golden line tamarinds. It was about where does the water come from from Sao Paulo. And we're seeing it written into local, regional, and global strategies, this whole idea of rebuilding systems and large-scale allocation of land. Um, our patron saint of the business, E.O. Wilson, with his half-earth agenda that is really beginning to build up momentum through to Cornwall's environmental growth strategy that looks at rewilding and rebuilding landscapes and watersheds. So there's some extraordinary stuff happening, and this, is, this gives you a scale of the Everglades restoration, uh, you know, with Miami tucked on the edge of it there, and going all the way up to Orlando and central, central Florida. My colleagues at Florida International University were working on this, and they would come back from the field just elated, having got, go, walked through wetlands that had been flooded two years ago and seen fish migrations coming back that hadn't been seen in generations, or seeing the colonization of birds and plants back into old pastures. It happens quickly, and it can happen. This is South Korea, probably the one example of a country that has rebuilt its natural capital and done it at scale. This is a typical hillside. A colleague of mine describes South Korea after the Korean War as bald as a monk's head. And these are the typical scenes in the mountains of central South Korea of this new forest. Some of it's fairly sterile coniferous plantations. Increasingly, it's a matrix of native species, and the wildlife's moving back. Bears are coming back, wild boar are coming back. And the indicators of, of mature woodland, the mesic sort of herbaceous plants, are beginning to move in. And you can see forest. 
no forest. And we're seeing some extraordinary examples of linking conservation, biodiversity to water. Um, this is the Nairobi Water Fund, and again, the taps ran out in Nairobi. Many of us had been working to lobby on the preservation of the hills and mountains of central Kenya based on botanical bi diversity, endemic plants and animals. It needed the head of the Coca-Cola bottling plant and the brewery to phone the president to say we've got to do something about the Mao Forest. And at that point, the uh, Nairobi Water Fund was established that secures water for four million people and importantly secures the watersheds and the endangered bongo antelope. A lot of these now in South America, particularly in Colombia where they've been pioneered and I think they're extraordinarily exciting. And we've got the power of the farmer. Will was talking about how farmers can change the land and one of the most enthralling projects for me is how individual farmers in the Sahel, no one from USAID, no one from the World Resources Institute, no one from the GEF have gone about and improved their farms in response to changing weather and putting trees back to protect their crops against drought and is entirely farmer driven. Now we've got the bizarre rewilding and ecological substitutes game and I think this is beginning to take off. The wolf to Yellowstone we all know about, the Mauritian giant tortoise on Mauritius now substituted by the Seychelles giant tortoise and, and immediately seed um, these, these giant tortoise already processing and processing tropical, uh, the native fruits there and seedlings are coming up that weren't seen there before the giant tortoises. And now in Europe, we're confident enough to have a go at rewilding. This is Oostwaardeplazen in uh, the Netherlands. Completely new habitat. It was sterile polder and it's been now established as a somewhat synthetic mock-up of what possibly a prehistoric landscape might have looked like. But breeding sea eagles, incredible insects and birds coming back, it's functioning as an ecosystem. Totally synthetic, totally artificial, but lots of really good species and interesting dynamics going there. And this year, you know, you look at countries around the world and you look for leaders and you look to see who's going to really de deliver conservation. And Chad has come up out of nowhere as a place delivering conservation leadership. Uh, 2018 this year, reintroduction of rhino after extinction in the 1970s. Last year, the reintroduction of scimitar horned oryx after it became extinct in the wild. Chad is doing something rather fascinating. We need to know what they're doing. But they, they've taken real leadership in regenerating protected areas and regenerating tourism as a result. So I'm going to leave you with this, this challenge. If we remove natural from our equations and we remove our constant harping back to historical models for conservation, we've got some really interesting challenges as to what we will do with conservation in the Anthropocene. A lot of it will be influenced by securing water, securing soil, securing carbon. But also, these habitats, this is a lovely North Kauai Hawaiian landscape. It looks absolutely fantastic. The last Hibiscadelphus woody eye is there. Over 90% of the biomass in that valley is exotic, not native to Hawaii. Functions perfectly well as a watershed, keeps the tourists happy, but is a biological desert. So we've got some real interesting challenges as we uh, go into the Anthropocene. But I would argue that if we start looking at rebuilding links with our urban populations, and looking at large-scale landscape conservation and large-scale landscape regeneration, we've got a hope of keeping some of the extraordinary biodiversity we value today, and perhaps in some places bringing it back to a level of abundance that would astonish our parents or our grandparents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.